Good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Varun Vani, welcome you all on behalf of Academia IPSM eConnect on the PG lecture series on the eConnect platform. Today's topic is snakebite management, the changing policies and strategies in the Indian scenario. Even though India has taken large leaps and bounds in the global eye, including the recent successful launch and landing of Chandrayaan on the moon, there are multiple aspects of health that are still faced by this country, which is predominantly based on agriculture and having the uh, infection in the tropical areas. Among the neglected tropical diseases, an important area is snake bite. To learn about this today, we have with us Dr. Pritam Roy, sir, NTD coordinator, WHO India. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of Academia IPSM. Thank you. So without uh, any further ado, I will hand over the uh, screen over to sir to take us through this journey of how to manage snake bite. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, being part of the IAPSM eConnect. And I convey my thanks to the PG lecture team, the eConnect team, and all the four patrons for providing me this opportunity to discuss about snake bite management. So today we will be mainly discussing on the epidemiology uh, bite to discharge, what are the facets that we have and how to manage our snake bite cases. And as I move forward, I would like to say that in the upcoming, the uh, contents were taken from uh, various national level presenters. And I acknowledge uh, the content and the training material and the PPTs uh, which I have gathered from uh, Poison Control Center, Christian Medical College Fellow, uh, Dr. S. Regulatathan, who is the State Nodal Officer, Poison Management in Chennai, Dr. Ajit, Deputy Director, NCDC, Dr. Ganeshwar from Madras, Crocodile Bank Trust, and Dr. Shwajit Giri, who is a consultant and astrologist from Nassim. So, acknowledging them, their contribution uh, for the content and the PPTs. A uh, snake bite basically is a acute life threatening conditions, and uh, it's a very diverse uh, people are being affected, and the, among them the high risk groups include those who are rural agricultural workers, the fishermen, the hunters, those who are staying outside in poorly constructed houses, uh, having access to bushes and trees. And children are more suffer from these severe effects than adults due to their smaller bodies. So many of the snake bite events are even not reported to the health system uh, due to poor health seeking behavior of the affected persons. So these potentially life threatening diseases of following the bite of a venomous snake is all we are going to discuss. Uh, only about half of all the snake bites are results in uh, environment and all snakes are not venomous. And even venomous snakes do not always inject venom during the bite. So the mainly the problem arises with the paralysis, a bleeding disorder, the kidney, the limb affected and local tissue destructions. So we will discuss in details uh, all those points. So snake bite is typically now included in the neglected tropical diseases uh, in many tropical countries. And uh, those are widely affecting the Africa, Asia, and Latin America. South Asia has uh, one of the highest incidents of venomous snake in the world. And Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, nearly constitute of more than 70% of the global snake bite mortality. And if we have the deaths from estimates of three to four million snake bites uh, results in death annually around 50,000 in India, which accounts for half of all the snake bite deaths globally. So if we look at the from the epidemiological point of view, so in the epidemiological trend, so snake is the agent human is the host, along with the favorable environment for snake bite like rural or agricultural area. And it mainly depends upon the frequency of contact between snake and human. And uh, 
we will see later on from graphs that it occurs more in summer and rainy seasons. And males are more affected in snake bite due to their outdoor activities, uh, especially after sunset. And the victim age varies, but the economically productive age group are more uh, are vulnerable at risk. So mainly we divide the snake bite classification into venomous bites and non-venomous bites. Uh, venomous bites are mainly neurotoxic, mainly from cobra or crates. It can be hemotoxic, like Russell vipers or neurotoxic, and it can be also biotoxic. If we see the four big, uh, the medically important uh, snakes causing or medically important bites in India, so these are the major, we have these cobra, crates, and the vipers, and which are almost found in majority parts of the India. There are certain uh, range-restricted species for South India, the hump nose pit viper, and also Malabar pit viper, which are on the extreme south. In Northeast, there are certain other like green pit vipers, uh, the cobra, and the red naked killbacks. So these are mainly found in the northeastern uh, part of the world. So if we see the Indian scenario state-wise, uh, the West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Odisha, Karnataka are the major contributors and are reporting snake bite cases and deaths. So it's not only that snake bite cases are occurring here more. I think uh, also the health system is uh, good enough to report that cases and with uh, over of time the snake bite management has improved over those areas and people are seeking you know health care uh, from the government institutes and that's why uh, the number of cases are also reported more uh, the currently the snake bites uh, cases and deaths are being captured through the central bureau of health intelligence information from the idsp and also in the IHIP portal. So in the IDSP, uh, cases of snake bites are reported under T form from a health facility. So if we look at the average number of bites reported in the last five years, from 2017 to 21 as per IHIP, it's 1.88 lakh. And also uh, there is a data uh, disparity between the number of reported snake bite cases from CBHI, IDSP, and information given from the program division by the state department. So there is a need to strengthen and streamline the data reporting system for snake bites in India. If we see the major challenges that we have are the burden of snake bites in India grossly underreported. Uh, nearly uh, one-fifth of the snake bite victims attend the hospital. The lack of access to rehabilitative care is one of the important. There is a belief and trust on the, an approach towards traditional healers for the treatment, which actually causes a delay in initiating the treatment. Lack of a community awareness, the financial burden, poor ambulance and hospital care. The, there are talks going on about the ineffective antivenom because of the ecotype of the protein and only uh, uh, two thirds are receiving the first aid at the site of incident. And uh, there are studies which indicate that currently marketed antivenoms were found to exhibit poor dose efficacy and uh, venom recognitions. So uh, we need to make up uh, antivenom formulations uh, currently beyond the four snake species only to more number of snake bites. So if we come to the first aid, uh, so the main idea is to uh, give uh, uh, initial first aid and we recommend the mnemonic do it right. So R means reassure. This is very important once a bite cases because there is a panic, panic attack which may lead to uh, cardiac attacks and also this uh, increased in heart rate also increases the circulation. So we try, we must try to reassure and make them uh, as quite possible. And then the most most important step is immobilization, immobilization of the bitten limb in the same way as a fractured limb. So it should not sub 
stop the arterial supply, but it should be uh, good enough to continue the arterial supply to go, but the venous return and lymphatics can be stopped. So the, this way, the spread of the venom can be uh, stopped. This is most important that one should not wait uh, for going to hospital. The more quickly we can go, the more quickly we can start the AVS management, the better the outcome and results are. And uh, we need to describe because essentially snake bite management is symptomatic. So based on the signs and symptoms, we do the treatment. So the progression of the symptoms and new symptoms manifestation must be told to the doctor. So this current standard, the reassurance is mainly to slow the heart rate, reduces the venom spread. Uh, immobilization is to, uh, especially the beaten limb is to be immobilized that slows down the venom spread. Uh, we should remove rings or other tight objects uh, at the site of the bite because that may have a tunicate effect. And uh, we should not put anything in around the bite wound. So because that prevents uh, the infection increases venom absorption and increases bleeding. So it should not be washed or rubbed by anything. We should not wash or rub or put something on the site of bite. Now, there are some variable practices, which I think is very important. One is the pressure bandage immobilization, which is being practiced in a lot of places. Uh, the basic idea is to block the lymphatic flow and the venous drainage. But however, uh, it is not very uniform. So the problem is that uh, the systematic review identified that pressure immobilization as an effective first aid measures, uh, the quality of evidence is very low and the practice of care is not uniform. So it may cause more harm than benefit. And there are chances of potential worsening to soft tissue injuries. So that's why it's not universally recommended, and we also don't recommend this pressure immobilization. Tunicate is another common thing that we see in the uh, case of the South Asian snake bite victims. And this is associated risk with uh, severe local damage, including ischemia, necrosis, and gangrene. So there are a few important points uh, while handling tunicates. So one is that uh, we should uh, never remove tunicate in emergency room. Please take the patient in a place where you can manage uh, other people are there and uh, test the presence of uh, pulse distal to the tunicate. This is very important while removing the tight tunicates because sudden removal can lead to a massive surge of the venom leading to neurological paralysis or hypotension due to vasodilation. And uh, we must be well equipped to uh, handle the complications such as sudden respiratory distress or hypotension. And if there is absence of distal pulse, then a blood pressure cuff can be applied to reduce the pressure slowly so that all of a sudden uh, the venom doesn't go. And this venom in the distal plot has a lot of uh, procoagulant enzymes which may cause a damage, vasodilatation, and may also lead to a hypotension. The next most important thing is a rapid transport to a medical center. So uh, this is the crucial determinant. The more quickly we can bring the patient to a treatment facility, the better the outcome will be. Because we know that delayed antivenom administration is associated with increased risk of complications. Basic idea to give antivenom is to neutralize the unbound protein. So more late we uh, do, that protein will be bounded and less unbound protein will be there, which can be neutralized by AVS. Uh, we had a non-randomized single arm uh, before after uh, study conducted in uh, Nepal in four villages where they have shown that pre-interview, they have done uh, an intervention of community awareness program and also taking the patient by motorcycle volunteering, taking the patient quickly to the center. And uh, this thing has a very good effect. So we can see that uh, with this, uh, the case fatality rate can be, uh, the post intervention has reduced a very significant level. So 
this is a very good method even when uh, ambulance or vehicles four wheelers are not available we can take the patient through a uh, uh, motorbike only but uh, we should be cautious that because uh, that may cause sometime airway obstruction uh, due to the position or uh, aspiration of secretion which may cause damage so those care should be exercised before taking that patient in uh, through bikes uh, regarding bite mark uh, we what we say that uh, bite marks to determine whether the biting species are venomous or non venomous are of no use because a lot of time those marks are not visible and even if visible they do not give a very good information regarding the management then once uh, the most important part of a snake bite is the painful progressive swelling which will say there is a local venom toxicity so this leads to a local necrosis which often has a very typical rancid smell the limbs and the affected part are swollen taut shiny blisters are seen chymosis occur and there will be a significant pain and this swelling will go on increasing and this may lead to also compartment syndrome and also the uh, the tender uh, lymphadenopathy we have these uh, clinical features uh, where the compartment syndrome is mainly diagnosed with the five p's so those five p's are pain pallor paresthesia pulselessness and paralysis or weakness of the compartment muscles so this is very important if we observe this we must suspect about a uh, impeding compartmental syndrome happening mostly in case of russell viper bite so there are mainly we say is the uh, two types one is hemotoxic one is neurotoxic so if there is a hemotoxic bite so there will be swelling and there will be a local pain at the bite site then uh, there will be pain on basic movement there will be absence of peripheral pulse there will be hypostasia the lymph node will be enlarged tender there will be continuous bleeding or oozing from different sides from the gum or other uh, orifices there may be epistaxis and even vomiting may be blood stain or there may be hemat uh, hematemesis or hemoptysis another important is uh, acute abdominal pain which may suggest uh, something gastrointestinal or ventricular bleeding there will be definitely a hypotension there will be low back pain uh, which indicates an early renal failure and a retroperitoneal bleeding the skin and mucous membrane may show evidence of petechia there will be a passage of reddish or dark color urine and there will be lateralizing of the neurological symptoms uh, there may be a parotid swelling or conjunctival edema also so these are like the tender swelling the gum bleeding and the dark color urine that we may see there may be certain life threatening complications like acute kidney injury uh, in which there will be declining urine output or there will be no urine output and there will be deteriorating renal signs such as rising serum creatinine urea or potassium mainly uh, Russell's vipers by frequently causes this acute kidney injury and we can find even bilateral renal tenderness and there can be also albuminuria hematuria hemoglobinuria etc then another life threatening condition is the hypotension so mainly because of the direct vasodilatation so hypotension is another very dangerous manifestation there are also parotid swelling conjunctival edema and uh, there can be also a long term uh, sequelae of a pituitary insufficiency especially in case of Russell's vipers bite now if we look at the neurotoxic environment so there will be a descending paralysis so initially the muscles innervated by the cranial nerves there will be ptosis there will be diplopia or palmoplegia the patient complain will be complaining of difficulty in focusing and the eyelids will heavy there will be a progressive swelling and local pain especially for cobra bite it and there can be a local necrosis and blistering there will be a paralysis of jaw tongue which may lead to upper airway obstruction and the pulled secretion may also cause uh, inability to swallow mainly because of the pharyngeal pulse 
there will be numbness around the lips and the mouth. There will be progressive pulling of the secretions and ultimately may go to respiratory failure. There can be a hypoxia because of inadequate ventilation and may result in cyanosis, altered sensorium, and coma. Uh, paradoxical respiration has sometimes been observed. Uh, sometimes in great bite, it's very typical to observe a stomach pain. The early morning stomach pain is very suggestive of great bites. And uh, maybe sometimes mistaken for stroke, but one should always remember these things. So these are the major like, uh, features that we see. So in the neurotoxic, there are five Ds and two Ps, which are very important. Dyspnea, dysphonia, dysarthria, diplopia, and dysphagia. And <laughs> two Ps, mainly tosis and paralysis. So first, there will be a following of forehead. There will be tosis. It will be followed by diplopia, double vision, followed by speech difficulty, dysarthria, follows by... Uh, change in voice, uh, dysphonia, and then dyspnea, or breathlessness, and inability to swallow. So mainly these are related to third, fourth, and sixth lower cranial nerve paralysis because of this neurotoxic effect. So uh, to identify that whether uh, impending respiratory failure is taking place or not, one of the important is the three tests. Bedside can be done, single breath count, so in one exhalation, usually if we can count the number of digits, more than 30 will be the normal, but they will be not able to count that. Uh, they cannot hold the breath for more than 45 seconds. And uh, in one breath, they cannot uh, complete one sentence. So if these are being observed, we uh, think about there may be an impending respiratory failure. There may be a late onset of envenoming in certain cases when we see the uh, signs of envenomation even after 24 hours, uh, particularly the crate or arm post pit by one. Now, this is something very important about crate bite victims. So they are absolutely painless. So the, one of the most important is the uh, there will be no uh, local signs of bite marks. It's very difficult to find and these early morning symptoms of like in the night times it's bitten and there is an acute pain abdomen with or without neuroparalysis. So this is very, very suggestive and sometimes we mistakenly think about acute appendicitis, acute abdomen, stroke, GB syndrome, myasthenia, gravis. So that we need to be take care. And there will be a descending neuroparalysis where in GB we will be having ascending paralysis. So this is something very important. And if you find any unexplained respiratory distress in children uh, in the presence of ptosis or sudden onset of uh, acute fla flaccid paralysis in a child, it should be highly suspicious of uh, crate biology. So that we need to take care. If we go for a local examination, we must look palpate for tender, lymph nodes and we must also look for any bruising are there over the enlarged uh, lymph nodes or not if there are red streaks over limb uh, suggesting that lymphangitis may present and whether there are any wound incisions or tunicates are there it should be noted or we should check for ectosis and uh, the extraocular muscles the papillary size symmetry and reaction the person can open mouth, put your tongue or not, and whether there is any pulling of saliva is there or not, a uh, gag reflex is present or absent, that should be noted. And we should ask the patient to lift the neck of the pain to assess the uh, neck flexor muscles. So, and we should also examine the muscles power, that is very important. And apart from the thing that we uh, discussed is single breath count, breath holding time, and ability to complete one sentence, which may indicate an impending respiratory failure. Also try to look for the CNS lateralization signs such as aphasia, hemiplegia, then any cardiorespiratory problem is there or not, any abdominal distension or pain or suggesting a retroperitoneal bleeding, any skin petechia, purpura, echoimosis is there. We must measure the blood pressure 
and look for the sites of any bleeding from oral or other sites. Uh, we should carry out a very simple medical uh, assessment and should take a proper history. Uh, look for all those physical examination, pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure is very important. There is something called 20 minutes old blood clotting test, which is also very important, uh, which can tell about the uh, hematoxicity is present or not. And then checking the distal pulse is also very important. So progressive local swelling is the commonest sign of envenomation and that should be present or not should be looked after. We should look for the neurological signs and symptoms. And in case of uh, hematoxic, we can do 20 minutes whole blood clotting test. So this is very, uh, uh, crucially requires a clean and dry glass test tube or glass vial. It should not be plastic because uh, it should have a glass that is silica and that stimulates the clotting of the blood sample. And there should not be, and it should not be clean. There should not be any detergent there. And we should take a 2-3 ml venous blood and keep it in an ambient temperature 20 minutes. Uh, within eight minutes, it is supposed to be clotted, but if there is not clotted and still liquid, that means there is an evidence of coagulopathy. And it indicates that the biting species is a viper. So this is how it looks. Uh, it will not clot after even after 20 minutes. So if we, when we do this uh, 20 minutes whole blood clotting test, so if there is no immediate sign of envenomation, we will observe that the blood is clotted. That means there is no coagulopathy and it may be a normal. And we can repeat for four times uh, and then uh, six hourly for the next 24 hours. Uh, if there is a features of hemotoxicity, then blood will not be clotted. So that means there is a coagulopathy is underlying there and suggestive of viper bite. So we should give a 10 vials of AVS and then we should after one hour of, uh, after one hour we should note down when the active bleeding is there or not. And if there is no active bleeding, we need not to give AVS. But if there is, then we should again repeat. And another important thing is that uh, this is for coagulopathy. But in neurotoxic environmentation, there will be no coagulopathy. So in cobra bite or cred bite, we may find the blood clotted, but then we must give 10 dose of AVS. So it's only uh, that if it is blood is clotted and we should not give AVS, the idea is nothing like that. Even in neurotoxic, we must give 10 dose of AVS and repeat. So that's very important because in neurotoxicity, there will be no coagulopathy. The management of snake bite basically actually uh, depends upon the first thing that we need is the ABC, the airway, breathing, and circulation needs to be ensured. Close observation of the local and systematic signs and symptoms and venomation. And then the important thing that we should not do is that we should not attempt to kill or catch the snake. Identifying the snake doesn't have much role because it's mainly clinical. So even if we want to go a catch, there may be a chance of second bite or sometimes the main snake bites and goes away and people take another snake, kills it. And also killing snakes is illegal. So there should be no attempt to kill or catch the snake as it is dangerous and not essential for management. Uh, max, to maximum, one can take a photograph from distant site. That is the maximum. But at no point one should try to catch or bring it in the health facility. And that has no meaning in better management. Uh, we should not put any incision. Uh, we should not suck, which is very common in uh, typical Bollywood movies that people start suck, suction of the site or any massage or applying of any chemicals should be avoided. Uh, we should not give any AVS locally. Uh, we should not put any tunicates and there should not be any uh, 
cutting or anything should be done and electrotherapy and cytotherapy, cryotherapy should be avoided. Now, when should we start AVS? AVS should be used whenever there is a evidence of systematic envenomation or severe progressive local swelling. So envenoming means either hemotoxic or neurotoxic features. If we find all any of the clinical features suggesting of neurotoxicity or hemotoxicity, or there is a severe progressive local swelling, we should start AVS. When we don't find uh, there is a uh, systematic envenomation, then we may go for 20 WBCT test. And if it comes clotted, then we should also start the uh, AVS. If we start AVS, it should we should give 10 AVS even for children because this is essentially to neutralize the uh, unbound protein of the snake uh, which is being injected uh, in the right side and which is equal for adult or child because that quantity of venom will be the same for all the cases. What we must care because uh, the volume of infusion is reduced according to the body size and the state of the hydration of the patient. So in oliguric patient, we must restrict the fluid and we must use infusion pump to give the AVS. Pregnant women should receive AVS and in the equal amount, children will also get AVS, but that can be reconstituted in uh, or diluted in five to 10 ml per kg body weight. And to reduce the amount of fluid, uh, we must think about it. And uh, in any life-serving surgery before, we should uh, go for this uh, ASV. Now, before starting uh, AVS, one of the important things that currently we recommend is pre-medication. Because uh, there is no uh, idea or currently we don't recommend doing giving a test dose. So test dose for AVS is not recommended now. Let it be very clear. And it's better to give uh, pre-medication. So injection adrenaline 0.2 ml is given subcutaneously as pre-medication. And actually the early uh, reactions can be majorly prevented uh, with this. And we can smoothly give in the AVS within the first one hour. So what happens? Uh, what is the pathophysiology, how this AVS works? So the venom that is being injected is something from 5 milligram to 147 milligram. So basically each ml of ASV neutralizes 0.45 milligram of common thread venom, 0.45 milligram of soft skin viper venom, 0.6 milligram of Russell's viper venom, and 0.6 milligram of chromium. So if we give uh, initially 100 ml, so it takes care of the uh, little dose that has been given and it may again be repeated to maximum 30 vials because after 30 vials there will be actually less chance of any unbound protein even with that time most of the venom uh, protein will be bound to the site and will have all the desired uh, adverse uh, events that are supposed to take place through the venom of the snake so it's essentially that this is the time that we should give those uh, 10 vials, repeat after one hour maybe, and maximum up to 30 vials. And it should be given very fast, and there is no benefit in administrating it over a longer period. So that is the basic idea that how this uh, snake bite venom is, uh, is, uh, works and mainly it will neutralize the unbound protein. So after giving the AVS, what will be the signs of recovery? When we will be sure that AVS is one. If there is a spontaneous systematic bleeding, such as gum bleeding or something, and it will stop within 30 minutes. So within one hour, if the bleeding stops, that means AVS is working. The blood coagulopathy is again restored the liver functions are normal and within six hours the coagulability is restored uh, in case of cobra uh, we can give avs and there can be neurotoxic economic signs may improve and blood pressure will be again uh, regained 
Uh, in case of viper bites, uh, once the initial dose has been administered over one hour, no further ABS is given for six hours. If there is no active bleeding, we keep on doing it every six hours at 20 WBT states and determine additional ABS is required only. If clotting defect is present, then there will be active abnormal bleeding even after first uh, one hour of the first dose. And then we should immediately give 10 vials as a second dose. So what should be monitored? Pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure every hourly, blood urea, creatinine, WBC count, potassium level, urine output, urine in RBCs, they are or not, then vomiting, diarrhea, abnormal bleeding. The extent of the local swelling or necrosis needs to be observed. Now, even after if there is any adverse reaction, so, or there is any anaphylactic or pyrogenic reaction, it should be immediately identified. So, what will be the common signs of these adverse reactions? We can have a urticaria, itching, particularly scalp itching, fever, uh, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, there will be tachycardia, hypotension, bronchospasm, angioidum. If there is any new signs uh, which was not there or any unexplained uneasiness after ASV infusion, always think about an adverse reaction because you need to manage immediately. So uh, once the pre-medication is given, even after that, stop AVS drip temporarily, give 0.5 ml adrenaline over IM over deltoid or thigh. Uh, and if the situation is not improving or horsepanning, a second dose of adrenaline should be given. We should give oxygen. We should start our IV normal saline infusion with a new set. And we can also give a hydrocortisone and anti -scarbonates. Once the patient has recovered, we should restart the ASB slowly for 10 to 15 minutes, keeping the patient under close observation. Now, if there is a neurotoxicity patient, which has a very clear objective evidence of neurotoxicity, that is ptosis, or inability to maintain the upward gauge, they should receive neostigmine along with the AVS. So atropine neostigmine or AN is very, very important in that case. So what will be the first step is to give the loading dose. So pre-treat with the atropine, 0.6 milligram IV should be given. And in case of children, 0 0.0, 0 0.02 milligram per kg with a minimum of 0.1 milligram atropine. And then treat with the neostigmine, 1.5 milligram IV or IM. Once the loading dose is given, then we should start the maintenance dose. So if there is an objective improvement after 30 minutes, then we should again repeat the neostigmine, 0.5 milligram IV or IM or subcutaneous every 30 minutes for five doses. And along that, with that, there will be a continuous IV infusion of atropine, uh, one ample of atropine over one bottle of NS should be given over eight hours. So it is very important uh, to start uh, atropine neostigmine is there is a definite objective evidence of neurotoxicity and it should be given stepwise first the loading dose and if there is an objective improvement then five doses every 30 minutes and then it should be tapered down to one hour two hours six hours and two hours majority of the patient will improve within the five doses When we should stop atropine neostigmine, if the patient has completely recovered from the neuroparalysis, then we should stop. Otherwise, if there is a side effects from this in the form of fasciculation or bradycardia, then we should stop neostigmine. That means there is an overdose of neostigmine has taken place and we should immediately give an atropine IV stat. And even after three doses of uh, atropine neostigmine, if there is no improvement in the neurotoxicity side, then there is no need to give further atropine or neostigmine. In that case, most probably that will indicate that there is a crate bite. What we need to know is that that crate bite affects the presynaptic fibers where calcium ions act as a neurotransmitter. So there is some debate, but uh, we can give injection calcium gluconate 10 ml IV 
slowly over five to ten minutes every six hours for the next twenty four hours, and usually this neuroparalysis recover. Though there is some debate about the benefits of calcium gluconate, but a certain section of physicians do recommend. Remember, antivenom treatment alone cannot be relied upon to save the life of the patient, especially those with the bulbar or respiratory paralysis. And in that case, respiratory support is very, very important that we need to provide. Other important challenge is the renal failure, which is a very common complication contributed by uh, intravascular hemolysis, DIC, direct nephrotoxicity. And a renal damage can develop in uh, Russell Viper bind. So we should try to give ASV as blistered as early as possible. And usually this shock takes place because of the excessive blood loss or plasma extravation or of myocarditis or because of Shiam syndromes and due to vasodilatation. And this shock can also contribute to acute kidney injury. Other Contributory cause of acute kidney injury are the nephropathy from hemp pigment, platelet or fibrin microthrombi, the venom mediated tubular damage, and immune mediated globular damage. So these are mainly associated with Russell vipers or Sawskill viper or pit vipers. So when we can understand that there is a renal failure. So if there is a declining our urine output or there is no urine, urine output, so that means there is a renal failure is taking place. And we should look for the serum creatinine, whether it is more than 5 gram per dl or there is a rise of 1 milligram per day. Urea level should be more than 200 milligram per dl. Potassium should be more than 5.6 millimole per liter. And there is evidence of uremia or metabolic acidosis. So to manage the renal failure, early initiation of ASV is very important. Hypotension should be managed. Coagulopathy should be managed. Hemodialysis needs to be done. And control of hyperthalamia is very important. In certain tertiary center, we do forced alkaline diuresis and through fusamide. So this is a good step. And, uh, but... Delayed uh, force alkaline dialysis has no role, so it should be done within 24 hours. And the basic idea is to avoid those pigment nephropathy, which may lead to acute tumular necrosis. What are the indication of dialysis, uh, dialysis in case of snake bite management? So if the absolute value of blood urea is more than 130 milligram per dl, or serum creatinine is more than 4 mg per dl, or there is an evidence of hypercatabolism, the form of a daily rise in blood urea, or creatinine level 1 mg per dl daily, or potassium level rising, or falling bicarbonate. So we should also look if there is a fluid overload, which may lead to pulmonary edema, if there is a hyperkalemia, and if it is an unresponsive to conservative management. If there is a coagulopathy, then we should also go for dialysis in case of prolonged uh, CT, PT, APTT, we should administer fresh frozen plasma infusion. And we should also look at the fibrinogen level. FDP should be estimated. And if there is a low fibrinogen and high FDP, that will require fibrinogen supplementation. Bleeding may lead to anemia, so that should be taken care of. Uh, we should avoid intramuscular injections during this period, and FFP administration should also be thought of. Uh, usually, antibiotics are not recommended, uh, but there may be a potential because uh, oral snake flora, and uh, there are a lot of uh, pathogens are there. So, if there is a uh, wound infection, we can give prophylactic broad spectrum antimicrobials uh, treatment for the cellulitis. Uh, and that should be given only after completion of first 10 vials of it. So, amoxicillin clavaclinic acid can be given. We can also give metronidazole infusion. And alternatively, ceftriaxone can also be given. If there is an hypotension, 
we should look about establish intravenous access, give a fluid challenge so that the blood pressure raises and should be stopped immediately if there is a pulmonary edema. If there is a pain, we should give paracetamol. Uh, we should avoid giving NSAIDs and maybe sometimes tramadols may also be relief. For coagulopathy, in case we should go for the fresh frozen plasma. If there is a progressive swelling, persistent or moderate swelling of the viper bite can be managed by repeated magnesium sulfate compressions that can be given. Uh, we should not be very enthusiastic about any necrotic tissue development. We should wait for certain one week before commencing any deployment and only the necrotic tissue should be deprived after uh, there is a good recovery. If there is a uh, late reaction or serum sickness, we can give chloroformamine 2 milligram in adults, six hourly for five days. And those who have failed to respond within 24 to 48 hours, we may give a five day course of prednisone. When we should discharge, if there is a no symptoms and signs developed after 24 hours, then patient may be discharged. But we have seen that 48 hours uh, should be observed because sometimes late envenoming signs are being observed. Uh, and even after discharge, he should or she should be followed. And they should be advised to return emergency if there is any worsening of symptoms or signs or evidence of bleeding or pain or swelling, difficulty in breathing, altered sensorium, uh, decreased urine output. So if those things are there, we may ask them to come back to emergency. The, in the rehabilitation, it is very important that a uh, patient with this severe local environment, they may maintain the limit of functional position. And they should be put on simple exercise so that mobility is maintained. And uh, severe deformity or stiffness can be avoided. Also, there is a very important component of mental rehabilitation is also required because there are lots of uh, stop, traumatic stress and depression or fear psychosis may take place, which also needs uh, good rehabilitative patients. So this is a main quick summary of the flowchart of a snake bite management. So if a patient attending an emergency room with a history of snake bite, then we should first respiration airway must be restored. We must always admit, give injection toxoid, remove ligatures, assess what is being there, if there is uh, any signs of toxicity, give 0.25 ml adrenaline subcutaneous as a pre-medication. Start 10 vials of AVS in running fluid in jet. No skin test is required. And then if there is no signs of emanation, uh, and then look at the, after one hour, what is happening if there is a viper bite or hemotoxicity, then uh, the bleeding should be going down. If not, then do WPT, WBCT test. If there is a neurological signs, look of the improvement of the neurological signs. Along with that, give atropine and neostigmine as standard. Uh, if even in neurotoxic cases, uh, there may be requirement of artificial ventilation. So if that respiratory distress continues apart from AVS, artificial ventilation support is required. For those who are having hemotoxic effect, improvement should be there. If there is no improvement, then again, it should be reported. 10 vial of AVS should again be repeated. And then we should also refer them for the dialysis. And <coughs> we should also keep uh, in hand adrenaline half ampule in case if there is any immediately adverse reaction. So if any of the PGTs or is trying to assess that what are the minimum things or essential things that should be in place in a health facility for a better snake bite management. So there should be every uh, unit which is dealing with this snake bite management should have AVS in them, adrenaline should be there, neostegmin should be there, atropine should be there, hydrocortisone, antihistaminics, 
analgesics like paracetamol, tramadol, NS bottles, antibiotics should be there. There should be availability of syringes, IV sets, clean new glass test tubes, blood pressure monitor, and AMU bags. Other desirables is that availability of oxygen uh, and laryngeal tube with laryngeal mask airway. This may be better, but at least these are the essential things which must be present in a center for better management of snake bite cases. There are certain late endocrinological features also because of direct hemorrhage in the glands. And there may be hypoadrenalism or hypoglycemia. There may be a shock and hypoglycemia. And sometimes delayed symptoms are observed. So these are the like late complications that we see post bite, a lot of ulcer and uh, skin manifestation and images which needs to be managed. So this is also one of the very common thing which needs to be looked. Coming to the end, uh, I think it's very important also to discuss the medical legal aspects of a snake bite. So medical legal cases are an integral part of the medical practice and uh, proper handling and accurate documentation is required. So in emergencies, if you are seeing any cases, the first step is to resuscitate and stabilize the patient, carry out all the first aid measures, and then focus on the medical legal formalities. The consent of treatment is implied in this case. Uh, what should be done is that the hospital should maintain a MLC uh, registered and our MLC should be initiated and documented in the register. The medical officer should prepare a detailed medical legal report with personal particulars, identification marks, person accompanying them, and on the examination findings, what they have observed. So those should be preserved, and then uh, the police should be informed as per Section 39 of Criminal Procedure Code, and we should comply with all the medical legal compliance. And in case of any discharge, transfer, or death of such case in the hospital, the police should be informed. Uh, if there is a death, no cause of death should be mentioned in the medical certification of cause of death, and it's better to write exact causes to be ascertained by post-mortem examination. Police should be informed who, after their medical legal formalities, will hand over the body to the kin or the relatives. So with this, uh, I say thank you and just to give you an overview of the snake bite management, uh, the things, the epidemiology and the initial fasted measures that we can have. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You have covered not only the medical management as well as the planning that is required in the steps as well as the medical legal aspects and the complications. You've given a holistic view of everything that we need to know regarding snake bites, sir. So thank you so much for such an informational session. There were a couple of questions that were uh, generated from the audience. There was a one question, right? Many a times anti-snake venom is found to be not working nowadays for treatment. So what would be the reasons? for? I think you have partly covered that it is not just anti-snake venom that is required, medical so management. There are well. a lot so, of yes, aspects sir. in it. So the first important is it's not AVS only. If we are thinking of clinical recovery, of the patient is more important how quickly we start the AVS. And then uh, apart from that, other supportive management should be there. But we are some uh, recently we are getting, especially for vipers, there are certain cases where because of change in the ecotype of snake, the AVS is may not be working in certain cases. So there are uh, certain cases and for which researches are ongoing, how to take care of them. Thank you, sir. So, and coming to the formulation of the anti-snake venom, mostly the polyvalent covers the four major disease, uh, major snakes uh, that are common in the country. With the increasing deforestation and urbanization, is there a need to update the, uh, the snakes that are covered for ASV, sir? Exactly. There is a, There are like lots of cases of uh, snake snake bites that are being reported. And also the snake ecotype depends upon the AVS depends upon the ecotype of the poison. So that also differ from region to region. So maybe which is uh, AVS prepared from snake venom of South India may not work very better for Northern India. So a lot of talks are ongoing, uh, researches are ongoing and uh, those are being done. 
there are our steps for synthetic uh, venom developments are also ongoing and we can actually identify what's the snake bite. So a lot of research workers are ongoing. There are new medicines are coming up which can prevent this absorption of this venom uh, and that can delay the uh, snake bite features. So that also gives a quick time to administer AVS and uh, tertiary management. So those things are ongoing. Thank you, sir. And also, like how there is a golden hour for thrombolysis. Is there any such uh, golden hour or a particular time period for snake bite management, or you start as golden soon as hour is one hour. So it's always better if we take. That was what I thought of in telling you right. So we should take the patient as quickly as possible and start the management. So always better outcome is better if it is within one hour. So, and uh, from the point of the healthcare facilities, that how do we calculate the amount of uh, anti-snake venom that should be present in a PHC? You mentioned what are the requirements in each PSE, but how to calculate the amount that should be present, especially with the under-reporting that is happening, sir? So that depends upon the local uh, snake bite registers or number of cases they are having. So based on that, I what I told you that on an average, Minimum 10 to 20 AVS is required at a periphery unit who's are managing, and then they may refer. So at least for the last year's snake bite cases, multiplied by 20 vials would be the minimum thing that should be there. And especially uh, those during the rainy seasons and uh, during the summer seasons, there should not be any stockouts. So that should be taken care of. Also, atropine and neosipine should be in stock. Uh, coming to the end of the discussion, thank you so much, sir, for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge and experiences regarding snake bite management from a holistic perspective. I would like to take a moment to thank our PG coordinating team and all the office bearers of IPSM to support us in this PG lecture series. Please do subscribe to the IPSM eConnect channel and stay tuned to further events. Thank you. As the moderator of the session, uh, I, Dr. Varun Wani, will bring the session to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.